hello everyone. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna be talking about um, software supply chain security, salsa, sig store, um, software build of material. Um, uh, my presentation is not really very long. Um, I don't have. I have a couple of slides. I'm just gonna talk about quite a lot of theoretical stuff, theoretical as in like concepts. Um, I'll do a demo. Um, I'm not sure. Um, my camera is turned off. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. What about now? Oh, now it's on. It should be good. Okay. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I don't. I don't think I need the whole forty-five minutes. But if there isn't really that much um, um, time needed for this, I'll be more than interested in actually spending time having questions. If there are any um, questions on the live stream. Um, my name is Abdel. I'm a cloud developer advocate at Google. Um, I'm also a Kubernetes uh, podcast co-host. Um, I've been working on Kubernetes for a very long time. Uh, I'm a CNCF ambassador, and I do quite a lot of work on Kubernetes and the Google version of that, which is called GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. And um, today we're going to talk a lot about how, why you should care about software supply chain security, right? Um, and the reason because... Um, I mean, software security has a lot of challenges. And um, what, what have been happening in the last couple of years is that um, we, we were great as, 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 as tech people in actually focusing on securing systems in production, right? Um, making sure, keeping the bad people out, making sure your systems are as safe as they can. But, but people who want to attack you are also clever and they're trying to find new ways to do so. And in the last a couple of years, what have been happening is that those people who are trying to attack you are trying to do it in different parts of your system, not only in your production system, but also in what we call the supply chain or the software supply chain. So very briefly to, 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 to explain what people mean when they say software supply chain, well, supply chain essentially is the set of steps uh, that, that you would go through to get your software from, uh, from development to production, uh, similar to supply chain for food on how you get food from farm to table. Um, and software is, you know, software. So what we mean when we say software supply chain is essentially the entire process of getting your application from where it's developed, uh, starting from the developer laptop or the developer computer, and also starting from dependencies. Uh, where are those libraries and those dependencies pulled from? All the way until um, production, right? And every single step between those two things could eventually be vulnerable. A couple of examples that have been um, that have happened over the last couple of years. Solar Winds is a is a company, American company that sells a software uh, for monitoring. Um, they were hacked, um, and then um, by 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 extension of them being hacked, their customers got impacted. And uh, the biggest impact last year was um, the Continental uh, Pipeline, which is a pipeline that supplies the east coast of the U.S. with the uh, oil and gas. That was impacted, and and the company was down for a while, and it actually created a lot of panic, and people started going to the you know to the gas station to fuel on gas because people were feeling, uh, feeling that they will run out of gas. Uh, look for J. Everybody knows this. Um, next gen. So there have been more and more of these type of attacks happening over the last uh, few years. <clears throat> but I think for 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 probably a Nordic audience, for those of you who are listening to us who are from the Nordics, uh, the most recent example. That I can think of, uh, think of is Coop. Um, Coop is is a is a um, supermarket chain um, in Sweden. They also exist, I think, in Norway, and in a bunch of other countries. Um, uh, last year, they were actually impacted. They had to um, uh, close their stores for twenty four hours. About five hundred stores in in Sweden for five for for twenty four hours. And the reason what happened, um, I'm using. I'm, I'm sorry for using this this um, uh, uh, nesting doll example. Uh, I, I know it's not everybody's favorite, but it actually illustrates a point. So Coop um, uses a third-party company to manage their um, uh, self-checkouts and their uh, cashier's software. So when you go to a store, you pick up your products and you go pay for them yourself. Um, the self-checkout system that you use was managed by third third-party company for Coop. This third-party company used a software from another company called Kasea. Uh, Kasea is an IT kind of asset management software. Um, so it's kind of software that you use to manage computers. And um, uh, what happened is that Kasea was hacked, was impacted. They pulled a vulnerable library. They built that vulnerable library into their software. They produced a new patch or a new version 
they distribute it to their customers. One of them is this third party company, which manages on behalf of Coop. And then that third party company used that software and that ended up impacting Coop. So th the whole point of using this nesting doll illustration is to say that like the software supply chain problems could actually be um, amplified by the virtue of using third party software, right? Because when you are using third party software, you don't really know where the software is coming from and how it has been built. Um, you don't have assurance, you don't have any sort of idea, or you might not have any sort of idea how it was built. Another example I think that that, that, that we could talk about very briefly is um, an example that happened a few years back where a security researcher managed to uh, prove a point that, that anybody can actually um, create vulnerabilities in software. Um, so what this researcher managed to do is get committer access to Homebrew, which is the um, uh, brew, the software that everybody uses to install other software on Mac. Um, so this person contributed code uh, in, in a totally legitimate way to the Homebrew GitHub repository. <clears throat> and that that basically meant that 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 uh, people um, or the, the the person, this this software, this um, a security researcher managed to become a committer. And by becoming a committer means that they could actually commit code to the homebrew software, to the main branch without uh, requesting uh, pull requests or without requiring pull requests. And uh, therefore they could just basically, you know, introduce backdoors to everybody's um, computers. And that's basically the results of the fact that building software today is extremely complex. complex. So it might look simple. Um, you have some source code, you have a build system, and then you have some dependencies and you take your dependencies, you take your source code and you build them. But, and then you package them and then you run them in production, right? Uh, but actually what, what, you, what you might not be aware of is that even your dependencies have the same exact cycle. So they also start with source code, build system, package. They might not end up being run or production because the end result of a dependency is a library, but, but, but the, they follow more or less the same exact example, right? The same exact set of steps. So this means that in this whole process of building software, you can have any combination of these kind of problems. You can start with the vulnerable package, right? Um, you have clean code, your developers are doing the right thing, they're writing clean code. Your development pipeline is pretty good. You are using legitimate channels to, to distribute your software, but you end up with a vulnerable software at the end because you started with the vulnerable package. So that's the uh, Cassia Coop example. Um, you could start with a vulnerable package, um, clean code, clean development pipeline, but then you have malicious updates. So you install something that itself updates itself after it has been built into your software, right? Um, so I said itself twice, but basically what I mean is that you install a software that performs an update in production. Um, and then you end up with a vulnerable software. You might have actually everything clean from the beginning. All your packages have been vetted. All your packages have been tested and, and you're sure that they're good. But then um, you have a vulnerable source code. You have an internal malicious actor, which could happen. Um, uh, somebody who's trying to hurt you from the inside, who's trying to introduce bugs, right, um, on purpose. And you end up with vulnerable software. Or uh, my favorite example is um, you could have everything clean, but you are using third-party CI/CD pipelines, third-party development uh, pipelines. Um, so um, uh, my favorite example last year was this company. I'm not going to mention the name. Um, um, it's just a managed CI on the internet. It's a managed uh, cloud-based CI uh, that a lot of people actually use. And they were hacked. Um, somebody managed to leak their AWS keys and their customers' AWS keys. And they were basically not aware of it. It took them two weeks to realize. And after two weeks, they started contacting their customers, telling them, please uh, fix your, well, rotate your keys, right? So you might be doing the right thing internally in your company, but you depend on somebody who is not capable of aware of what they're doing. And then you end up with vulnerable software, right? So you might have any combination of these kind of problems, essentially. That's because the supply chain is vulnerable to a lot of attacks, right? Um, every single step could be uh, compromised, um, starting with uh, bad code, you know, internal malicious attackers, um, compromised source control. Um, we have all at some point in our career checked in AWS secret keys to um, GitHub. Um, uh, vulnerable, soft, uh, vulnerable dependencies, we talked about it, vulnerable build system, um, uh, compromised packages um, or compromised deployment pipelines or compromised runtime, right? So 
any step of this, any step in this entire process could actually be vulnerable to one or multiple types of attacks. And that's what the whole software supply chain security is all about, is how can we make sure that as software is going from one step to another, it is not compromised, it is free of vulnerabilities as much as possible, and we can build trust into the system. So you might be asking, now what? Um, so this whole set of challenges have prompted um, the development of a movement that people call shift left. Um, the, the, sometimes people refer to it as zero trust. I do not personally like neither of the terms. Um, zero trust is an, is, is, a, is an imported term from networking security, uh, but essentially, um, somehow my camera keeps turning off. I don't know why. Okay, now you can see me again. Uh, but essentially what zero trust means is that how can we make sure that the software that my developer is building on the laptop is the exact same software I am uh, deploying in production, right? How can I build trust in the entire process from development all the way until run? And I'm going to show an example later of how this could be established in a very simple way. It's a very basic demo, but it gives an idea about, about like the how the process could look like. And also, uh, the shift left movement, what it is essentially is how can we move the responsibility of security back to the developers? So instead of having security being a production only problem, it, it becomes a problem or a responsibility rather across the entire process of software, software supply chain. Um, so I know that when when I when 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 people talk about uh, shift left, uh, a lot of developers uh, kind of um, freak out because they, they they figure out like oh this is going to be our problem. The whole point here is not to make developers responsible; it's just to make them aware of what they're doing. And there are actually multiple ways you can do that. So one of which is this effort called Sixtor. Um, so Sixtor is a project. Um, it's, a, it's a community, um, it's a group of people that go together and they decided we are going to try to make open source as safe as possible, right? And they do that through uh, three main steps. Um, the, the easiest way to implement shift left is to sign stuff. So how can we use cryptographic signing? Um, I'm not talking about crypto as in Bitcoin, but cryptographic <laughs> signing or encryption to basically make sure that we can authenticate software um, from source, right? And then how can we verify that the software have been uh, built the way it's supposed to be built? I don't know why my camera keeps turning off, by the way. I have no idea what's going on. Um, this is the first time this happens. Sorry about that. And then how can we monitor? How can we make sure that those um, logs for the verification and the, the signing process are accessible to everyone, right? So it is... Uh, an effort by multiple companies. Uh, one of them is 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 a is, is actually not not a company. It's a foundation called the Open SSF, the Open Source Software, um, the Open Software Supply uh, Software Security Foundation, which is under the Linux Foundation. There is also a lot of companies called like like ChainGuard, Cisco, Google, etc. Um, they are basically a community of of, of folks. And they have a couple of components. Uh, I'm gonna demo Cosign. Um, it's part of my demo. I'm gonna do. But they have uh, OpenID Connect, which is an identity layer. So it's a way for you to identify um, users. Um, they have a certificate authority, a CA. So that's where you um, uh, create and verify keys. They have something called Recore. And Recore is uh, basically a public ledger for signing and verifying signature. Um, uh, uh, they have Felucio, which is a root uh, certificate authority. And they have a trust store, which is what you need to be, have, to be able to have a CA, right? Um, so today we're going to just look at Cosign very briefly. Cosign is a generic signing tool that you can use to sign any image, any OCI image, so Open Container Initiative image. Um, you could use uh, either uh, the certificate authority from Sigstar to do that, or you could use keys that you produce yourself to do that. And we're going to use keys ourselves. And this is how Sigstar edition of a software supply chain could look like. So this is not how everybody should implement software supply chain, but it's just an idea how it should be implemented. Essentially, as a developer, I produce software, I sign my software, I publish the software, and I publish the signature of the software. And then anybody that has access to that software at the signature can either look at the record transparency log in the case of Sigstar to basically see if my software have been signed by the right people, or they could just use the key to verify the signature, right? So this, this very simple concept um, is what we mean by shift left. It's essentially making sure we can identify 
and we can uh, trust software from which where it was produced all the way to where it's running. Um, they also have a framework um, called SALSA, uh, SLSA, which stands for Software Levels of Something Assurance. I forgot what the S stands for. Um, essentially, what SALSA is, is a set of uh, practices that you should or you can implement in your um, CI, CD infrastructure, right? And if your infrastructure meets those requirements or that those checklists, then you are compliant with SALSA either level one, level two, level three, or level four, right? Um, this is how those levels uh, pan out. I am not going to spend too much time explaining them. Um, I think you can look them up. But essentially, it, it spans across four different steps. How your source code is managed, how you build your system, how you identify the provenance. In other terms, how do you identify where your, your, your software is coming from? And a set of common practices, right? Uh, so if we take SALSA level three, which is... In my opinion, the most common, the most, the, the one that that everybody should at least strive to be to be at. Um, um, well, it has things like version control, obviously Git or whatever. Your build system is scripted, and you are able to attach provenance. In other terms, you're able to, when you build software, attach metadata to software to say this is who built the software, this is when it was built, these are the dependencies the software contains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And speaking of dependencies, um, there is also this thing called SBOM or Software Bill of Material. And what SBOM is, it's essentially um, generate, it, 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 it's a metadata that you can add to your artifact, which identifies where the artifact is coming from, right? So what's, what, 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 uh, sorry, not what, what packages have been used to um, build into um, the, the, the artifact and uh, where are they coming from and timestamps and stuff like that. So in other terms, you can think of SBOM as the list of ingredients um, in a recipe, in food recipe, a list of ingredients that have been used to build um, a software, right? Um, the provenance, which I talked about earlier, is the, the, the recipe itself. So SBOM is the ingredients and provenance is the recipe. So you take the ingredients, which are the dependencies, you take the recipe, which is how you build these dependencies, and you end up with an artifact, right? And then you attach both the provenance and the SBOM to your software. By the way, this is not... Uh, um, so SBOM is available in mostly two formats, uh, Cyclone DX and SPDX. Um, those are just indication of how the actual format looks like. Um, so it's either text or JSON, really, um, how it ends up being. And you can also, another thing, you can also sign the SBOM. Um, it's it's another thing that people do, which is you generate an SBOM and then you sign the SBOM itself, such a way that if your artifact changes, then your SBOM would change and you can uh, verify that the signature have been valid. Um, if anything changes, the signature would change and your verification process would break. Um, and uh, Rustam have just told me that S SALSA stands for supply chain levels of software architect. Thank you. So this the combination of these two things, um, uh, SALSA, um, which is the supply chain levels of software architect uh, artifacts, and the SBOM are two steps that you can add to your software supply chain, to your CICD pipeline, to make sure that you have some level of shift left, some level of uh, verification or trust from where software is built to all the way where it's produced. And very soon, and by soon I mean 2025, actually adding SBOM will become mandatory in the EU, in the European Union, to some companies operating in certain um, key, um, they call them key uh, industries, like energy, gas, healthcare, et cetera. Um, it, people will be forced to do that. So, so so in other terms, what I'm trying to say here is the sooner you can get to learn what SBOM is and start implementing it, the better it's going to be for you and potentially your boss. So let's see how this whole thing looks like, right? Um, and I am not seeing my... Um, Sorry, Rustam, I'll have to add, have you um, add my screen again. All right, thank you. Cool. So this is, um, I'm going to just do a very quick demo. Um, um, so um, let's start with something very simple, right? I'm just going to import a bunch of variables here. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, I already authenticated, and I'm going to start with a very simple um, thing. So I have a very basic app here. I'm just going to build it. Um, 
uh, this is not nothing um, too complicated for you folks to understand. <laughs> I'm just running a Docker build on a, on a source code uh, to build an image. And I'm going to show you what I mean by, uh, come on, hopefully this is not going to take too much time. Um, building stuff live on a, on, a, on a talk is actually a great way to <laughs> have a broken demo. But anyway. Um, so what I'm what I'm gonna do in the demo is I'm gonna show how can I as a developer build an app, sign it, uh, verify the signature, and make sure that the application that I'm deploying is actually signed by me or by the key that I use for signing. Right. So here I'm just building a very simple app, as I said, um, just a Go Go application, and I'm giving it some time. I should have done this before the talk actually. <laughs> But it's okay. It buys me some time. And um, while this is happening, actually, I can show you something. I have a very um, simple Kubernetes cluster. Um, uh, let's see. Do we have anything running there? Yes, we do. Let's delete this one. Um, all right. And uh, then I have also, I can show you something. I have actually a key. Um, so on Google Cloud, we have something called KMS, which is stands for Key Management System. Um, and I already created basically um, an encryption key. So it's an asymmetric, uh, hold on, G Cloud KMS keys list should be there now ah. Going on, okay. That's kind of funny. Ah, no, uh, yeah, yeah, because I opened a new tab, of course. Mm. So I already created the key, should have it here. Yeah, so here is my key. Um, it's basically just an asymmetric. Uh, sign-in key or an asymmetric encryption key. So it has a public and private portion. Um, I have my image, which I already built here. Um, so this is my image. It's the Hello World image. So let's do something uh, very quickly. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, push it to a remote artifacts registry, right? So very simply, I am. Um, uh, um, I should tag it first. Um, I'm just going to push my image to an artifact registry. So I'm storing it somewhere, essentially, right? Um, so it's going to take a little bit of time as well. Um, maybe we can um, go ahead and do the same thing for the... Uh... Oh, okay. It was pushed. Okay. I'm also going to... I'm just tagging the image twice, uh, by the way. Um, let me show you. I'm tagging the image. I'm tagging it with two tags, one called unsigned and one called signed. And I'm going to push both. Um, so I have both images available in my remote um, GitHub repository. And so I'm going to start with something very simple. I'm just taking that unsigned image and deploying it into Kubernetes. For you, those of you who doesn't know, I'm just creating a deployment in Kubernetes and deploying an application. So if I try to see if my app have been deployed, obviously it have been deployed. It's running, right? But here what I did is I. I, I, I pushed and deployed the unsigned version of the image. Um, so this is not what you want to do. Basically, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the image that you have uh, pushed to production is signed and verifiable by a source. So this is where cosign comes handy. So cosign is a command line tool. And what it does is allows you to sign an image using a key. So here I have a dash dash key argument, which uses my GCP KMS key. And it just signs my image, which I showed earlier. So if I run it, um it will oh ah damn okay um 
Uh, sorry. Okay, this is not going to take too much time. Uh, this should work now. Okay. Uh, okay, that's not working for some reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on here. Um, uh, Abisha, come on. Ah, no, okay. Uh, I know what, what's going on. It's the image is the image name was wrong. Um, okay, cool. So I'm pushing the signature of the I'm, I'm I'm signing the image. So I sign the image and then I attach the signature to the image. So in other terms, the image um, has the signature attached to it. I don't have access to the console to, to show you, but what you can do is I can um, verify the signature of that image, right? Um, so if I do hello world signed, I can run my cosign again. Uh, which is the same command line, and I can do a verification process. So I can verify using the same KMS key um, on the same um, image, which is the hello world signed image, right? Um, so here I say the cosine uh, claim was validated, the signature was verified against the specific public key. Good. Now, what this allows me to do, I can also generate some S bomb. Um, there is like a tool called uh, uh, Sift or something like that, that you can use to generate, generate SBOM and you can also verify the SBOM, etc. I'm not going to do that right now. What I'm going to do, however, is I have um, on my Kubernetes cluster, I deployed what we call an admission controller. So what an admission controller is, it's essentially an agent that verifies certain conditions. So you can deploy it and then you can instruct the control plane of Kubernetes to say, before you deploy this kind of objects, talk to this application and the application will tell you if this this um uh, this deployment or this object should be admitted or not so i already deployed my admission controller so here i'm just creating a policy and the policy what it basically does is that it verifies all the images and it makes sure that they have been authenticated against the key that i have used uh, or signed in other terms right so this is um i think already deployed so i don't have to deploy it again but let's go ahead and do it anyway good so I'm going to create a random namespace. Um, this is just uh, for testing. And the way this admission controller works is that you have to add a signature, which is this signature here. Um, uh, sorry, a label. So you, you add a label to the namespace that says policy.6store.dev include through. This would allow you to exclude certain namespaces in Kubernetes if you don't want them to be enforced by the key. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to deploy the unsigned image, not the signed one, to my test namespace. And this should fail because that, the unsigned image have not been verified. And obviously, it fails, right? Um, but then I can try to deploy the actual signed one, uh, like this one. Uh, hello, hello world signed. Uh, I can deploy this one to the test namespace. And this should just work, right? It gives pods, dash, and test. Um, and it works. So this is essentially what we mean by shift left. In other terms, shift left is Make sure that the developer that built my software signs the software in such a way that when I deploy it, I can verify against a specific signature, or at least part of what shift let means. Uh, and that's it. That's actually my demo. I'm gonna switch back to my rest of my screen. Just have a couple more screens, and then um, I'm gonna have you add my demo again. Now, thank you very much. All right. So, um, the big picture. So. What does this, this means really? If you're on Google Cloud, um, and this is my only slide about our products, um, I don't want to force you to use a specific thing, but this is how we do it. This is how we think it should be done. Um, we have certain products that you can be used to implement this entire software supply chain security process, uh, starting with Cloud Workstations, which is the, what we call a CDE, a cloud development environment, um, or a VM in the cloud in which you have um, an editor and you can use it to de develop stuff. Um, source control, obviously, Cloud Code is an extension of visual code that you can actually add to your visual code, and it does have a bunch of features. One of them, which is coming very soon, um, uh, by coming, I mean it will become um, uh, GA soon. And again, GA free of charge, no string attached, is something we call Cloud Code Source Protect, which is an extension that would allow you to actually add 
a plugin to your visual code. And what that plugin will do is that it will scan your dependencies as you're writing software. So directly inside your IDE, you will have a tab. And in that tab, you will see vulnerabilities as you're, um, you're building. So it will read your requirement.txt or uh, pox.xml or whatever. And then it will verify those dependencies and tell you um, if there is vulnerabilities. The other product that is free is called Assured OSS or Assured Open Source Software. Assured OSS is essentially a set of Python and Java and very soon no GS packages that we verify and fast test and we provide for free, right? So you could use those as well. Um, again, free, no string attached. And then you have your cloud build, your CD, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. This is what we mean by shift left. Those three products on the left can be actually used to implement part of what we shift, what the shift left uh, movement of security is. You do not have to use cloud uh, workstations. You could use Gitpod, which is a competitor software, um, or you can use your own um, visual code on your own laptop plus the cloud code um, uh, uh, plugin, right? And with that, thank you very much. That's all I have today. I hope I didn't take too much time. I think you still have like, 14 minutes or something. So I'm not sure if there are questions um, or not. That's my Twitter, by the way. Um, feel free to follow me there. I do share quite a lot of stuff about this topic and a bunch of other topics. <laughs>